Today is Wednesday, July 17th, and this is William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. Thanks be to God, I have a few days to get out in the woods and unwind a little bit, relax with my wife and kids, and obviously um, I've been paying attention to all of the political craziness going on, especially with the attempted assassination of President Trump, which was just surreal to watch and I think even more surreal to think about. I'd like to share some thoughts on politics. I don't talk too much about politics, and after this talk you'll see why. But I'd like to share some thoughts because there are some controversial issues in the current election cycle. And I'm afraid that many Christians will make some mistakes in how they think about them. And I'd like to offer some some insight if I can. And what I'd like to propose is something pretty simple. I'd like to argue that there are three important political groups, three important political groups that we should be aware of. And they're sort of mixed together. Two of them are easy to identify, but one of them is a little more difficult to identify. And it's important to identify it because it's, it's the right position. And I think if we, if, we, if we think about this rightly, we'll see that in God's providence, this is where politics are moving in this pres uh, present election cycle, and it's, it's good for us. Now, as for identifying these three political groups, I'd like to start with the two extremes. First of all, the anti-Christian, normally associated with liberal, left wing of the political spectrum, and we can consider this the Democrat Party, which obviously is represented in its majority by people who are opposed to Christian morality. <clears throat> but that's really not what's, what's evil about their political position. It's not a big deal to have people who are opposed to Christianity, especially when we get into politics, because in America, people have the right to vote. They have the right to believe what they believe, and they have the right to vote according to what they believe, and it's to be expected that many people in society will always be non-Christians, <clears throat> and they're non-Christians because they think Christianity is wrong or undesirable. And so they're anti-Christian. But that's really not the problem with this group. The problem is that not only are they anti-Christian, but they want to use political power to enforce their anti-Christian views. They want to use political power to force their moral and political views on the whole society. It's this desire to use the government to force your views on others that's actually evil. Again, it's understandable that many people are not Christians, and that they would be anti-Christian. That's understandable. That's even reasonable. 
in many circumstances. But what is not reasonable is the attempt to use the government to force one's religious beliefs on others. I could even add to that, it's evil to attempt to hijack public resources to fund one's private agenda. When we consider that the, the American public pays taxes and those tax monies are gathered together into a common pot, that pot is supposed to serve the common good. That pot is not supposed to serve the interests of a part of American society. And yet this is what this group seeks to do. This group seeks to gain control of American resources, public resources, and then use them to enforce its own religious, political, moral, economic views on others to basically enslave close to half of the U.S. population. So it's characterized by two qualities. First, it's anti-Christian, and secondly, it's tyrannical. That's one extreme, one group. The second group is on the opposite side of the scale. And this would be Christian Americans who want to commit the same evil. Christian Americans who desire to take control of the American government and use it to force Christian values on non-Christian people. This often is supported by Christians because they're happy that it's their views that are supported, that will benefit. But this is not a just political position, especially in America. And it's this position, this pro-Christian, Christian values, it's called conservative, right-wing, and so on, this pro-Christian group is just as destructive in America as the anti-Christian political group on the, on the opposite far left. What they both have in common, what they both have in common is a strong worldview in which they are not confident. <clears throat> And I'll say that again because this is the key. They both claim to hold a worldview very strongly that they don't actually have confidence in. And it's because they don't have confidence in it that it's true. It's that, that lack of confidence that leads them to try and make use of government power to force it upon others. And so both sides, both opposite sides of this political spectrum err not in having opposing worldviews, but in attempting to seize control of political power in America to try and impose their will upon fellow Americans who don't agree with them. And this, of course, is contrary to the whole purpose of America, contrary to the Constitution. And it's why both sides of this dispute will be found frequently ready to just transgress the Constitution. Right-wing Christians 
will attempt to force Christian morals on non-Christians. Left-wing anti-Christians will attempt to force anti-Christian morals on Christians. And it's this attempt to turn democratic power into a means of tyranny that's ultimately wrong with both sides. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian. If you look at government in America in that way, you're wrong. If you think of the American political system as a means by which you can gain control of public resources and then use them to force Christian beliefs or force Christian morals on other Americans, you're wrong. And that political worldview contradicts the gospel itself, contradicts everything that Christ did and taught in his life, everything the apostles did and taught, everything the saints through history have done and taught, contradicts Christian theology itself and is consequently the result of A, a false understanding of Christian teaching, and B, a false understanding of the role of government. And Christians are as guilty of this evil as non-Christians. And so when we see the, the political nastiness between the right and the left, liberals and conservatives, what we see are, are these two sets of enemies, political enemies, that don't see each other as fellow Americans, but who see each other as competitors fighting for control of resources that aren't theirs. Conservatives often accuse liberals of being communists or socialists, but what the right-wing groups try to do is just as socialistic or communistic as what the left wing tries to do. That's why we see the left wing calling the right wing fascists. And we say, what are you, crazy? You're fascists. You're the ones who are trying to force things upon Christians in America. How in the world can you be calling conservatives fascists? They're right. The conservatives that they're talking about are fascists because they're trying to use political power as a means of oppression. Both sides do the same thing. Both sides are equally wrong. Now we can, it's easy to identify these groups because both of them take extreme positions and they're very rigid in those positions. So we can see this character by the rigidity and the extremity of their positions. We'll see, for example, on the left side, a desire to push grotesque LGBTQ activity into public schools or public libraries. And you wonder, how can they possibly think that this is fair to the people in the community? When we look at numbers, the LGBTQ community represents like 4% of the population. How can they have this control of a democratic society? It's wrong. It's morally wrong. But we see them trying to push it upon others, push this view upon others as extreme as it is, and they do so with, with violent rigidity. And yet we see the right wing do the same things. They take extreme rigid positions, like an all-or-nothing position on birth control or abortion. And they insist that it's either all or nothing. 
and they attempt to force their morals, even though they may be objectively true, they try to force them on a society that doesn't share the religious convictions upon which, or from which I should say, those moral conclusions are drawn. And this is wrong. That's not what the American political system is for. So we've got these two extreme, rigid groups that are fighting against each other for control of public resources that they intend to use to force their opponents to follow their extreme views. Both of them are wrong. Both of them are anti-American. And thankfully, the foresight and wisdom, political wisdom at least, of the Founding Fathers created a system of checks and balances that causes these two extreme groups to cancel each other out, to neutralize each other. And that's what has kept American society somewhat stable and safe for all Americans. But we can see both sides are willing to not have it so. And so we hear talk about there being civil war because these two sides will literally kill each other for control of American political power. And as I said before, the fault of both of them, the weakness of both sides, is that for all their talk of their beliefs and views, neither of them is confident that its worldview is true. And what I mean by that is neither of those two sides is confident that if, if we just let things play out, just let everything go, let everything work itself out, let every idea manifest its own effects, they're not confident that if their ideas were allowed to manifest their effects in an, in an open market or an open, fair playing field, they're not confident that their ideas would actually prove themselves to be superior. And so they don't want to allow that test to take place. Instead, they want to try to take hold of the power without any such contest and force the outcome. They see force as being necessary because they don't have confidence that their view would actually prove itself to be true. And so for all the talk, especially of the Christians on the far right, for all the talk, the reason why they're so obsessed with political power, so obsessed with controlling public resources, is because they don't actually believe that if left to compete in a free society, their views would actually prove themselves to be superior. And yet, that confidence is specifically what marks the teaching and life of Christ and of the apostles and of all the saints. What marks the life of Christ is his confidence in the truth of his teaching. What marks the lives of the apostles is their confidence that God's will will be done, even by humiliating means, as they preach the, preach the gospel and suffer persecution. They trust that the truth of their teaching and the, the superiority of their life will overcome all obstacles. And this is why it's said of the early church that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. That's a spirituality 
that American Christians, especially because of their Protestant influence, really don't understand. They don't understand that when Christianity and its alternatives are allowed to work themselves out together, Christianity proves itself to be superior. And Christians are supposed to have this quiet confidence in Christian teaching and in Christian virtue. And so the third group that I'd like to talk about, the third group in our political system, are those American people, whether they be Christian or non-Christian, who do not seek to control their opponents by force, who don't see America's public resources as the means by which they might promote and enforce their own position, but who actually believe that their worldview, their way of life, their teaching will prove itself true in a free society, or at least will be a means of happiness in a free society. These are people who respect the common good. These are people who accept the realities of the Constitution, who can live in the presence of people who don't agree with them in peace, and who understand that there's a difference between contrast in the way we live and opposition in the way we live. If Christianity is in fact superior to atheism, shouldn't that become clear by the example and fruits of the lives of Christian people? And if it's not clear, why bother others with Christianity if it doesn't actually bear superior fruit? If Christianity and Islam live side by side in peace, shouldn't Christianity prove itself to be superior? If not, why bother Muslims and try to force them to live according to Christian rules? And the same thing can be said of Muslims. If Islam is a superior religion, if the Muslim life is a superior way of life, won't it prove itself to be so in a free society? Won't other people see, over time, the superiority of the quality of life that Muslims enjoy and freely choose to become Muslims for the sake of those benefits? Those who hold to different worldviews and do so confidently are eager for a free and open society because they believe that only in a free society can the merits of their worldview manifest themselves. And those who are not confident in their worldview, not only do they not think that their way of life and their teaching will manifest itself as superior in a free society, but they seem to also think that the views of their opponents will prove to be superior if allowed to manifest themselves. And that's why they want to forcibly snuff them out and not allow them to be practiced. And both of those extremes, as I said, are anti-American. I, as a Christian, believe that Catholic teaching is the truth and that the Catholic life, Catholic morals, are the best system of morals that can possibly be established. And I believe that if the Catholic life is allowed to work itself out in free circumstances, in the presence of all other views, all other worldviews, all other religious systems, I believe that Catholic faith and morals will prove themselves to be superior. And this is why I believe that 
the popes are always urging peace. They're always urging peace because in a fair and open society, those who possess the truth, those who practice the good, have the advantage. Those who are actually right have the advantage when there's peace, when we live in freedom. And therefore, for Catholic people, it will always be to our advantage for there to be freedom. And this even goes back to, to complex moral questions like, why did God allow Adam and Eve to be tempted by the devil at creation? Why would God allow evil spirits to prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls? Why would God allow this? And the answer is because God is confident that his truth and his goodness will overcome all false teaching and all deceitful appearances, not in thousands and thousands of years, but in short periods of time where our experience shows us the truth. God deals with us as someone who is confident in his ways. And so he lets us go astray, not because he doesn't care for us, but because he knows that the false things we hold to, the immoral behaviors we practice, will never satisfy us for long. And we won't persevere in them. And so he leaves us with free will, free to experiment, as it were. And this is the only moral thing that God can actually do, considering the reality that his teaching is true. A good example of this can be seen in the life of King David in the Old Testament, where after he had defeated his enemies, one of the leaders of his enemy was brought before him, having been captured. And his followers were excited to have captured this arch enemy of theirs, and they bring him before the king, expecting the king to punish him. And King David actually lets him go. And his followers, David's followers, looked at him like, what the heck are you doing? Why would you let this guy go? And the reason why was because David had already proven his superiority. David already knew that no one could resist him because his reign, living in a monarchy, by the way, was God's will. He released his enemy as a sign of his confidence. And that wasn't some kind of audacity or arrogance. That was actually truthfulness and reasonableness. And so we see in David, who is confident in the truth of God's ways and God's will and God's power, we see the confidence that actually promotes a free society. And this is what many Christians in America have all screwed up. They think that by talking about civil war or by acting viciously towards their political opponents, they're proving themselves to be faithful Catholics, faithful Christians, when in fact they're proving themselves to be insecure, and largely ignorant Catholics. So what I'd like to recommend 
for those of us who actually want to, to practice the truth, I recommend that we pump the brakes on the emotional, conservative, political messaging and that we think a little more deeply, a little more spiritually about what it is that we believe, what it is that we say, what it is that we do, and ask whether what we say and do actually makes sense in light of the life and teaching of Christ, the life and teaching of the apostles, the life and teaching of the saints, and the example of God himself in giving man free will. Ask whether our political views reflect this truth or whether they contradict it, whether we contradict God's will and example as much as our political opponents do. Now, as I mentioned before, I believe that in God's providence, the Republican Party is being led to a more compromising position. And of course, this has drawn anger from extreme Christians. But we see both President Trump and now Vice President candidate um, J.D. Vance taking a compromising position on contraception and, and abortion. And when I mention this word compromise, that word can be understood in two different ways. For those who belong to the extreme, rigid crowd, compromise means betrayal. Anything to the left of the extreme right border is just considered to be betrayal and liberal. Anything to the left from the far right extreme is unfaithful, betrayal, and so on. And you'll see people talking like this about this issue and many other issues. And the same is true on the left. Those who stand on the extreme left, these extremists, these rigid, combative, political men and women, they'll see anything to the left of the farthest extreme left position to be betrayal. And they interpret compromise to be apostasy. But if we go back to the example of the Founding Fathers, when America was established, and I don't know how much you've actually studied the history before the Revolutionary War, the history of the development of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the idea of compromise <clears throat> was not seen as a betrayal. Compromise was seen as a way of making progress while respecting your opponents. A compromise was considered a deal that was fair to both sides, that was respectful to both sides. And what was, what was good about a compromise is that the position that let's say the, the conservatives held, the position that was held after the compromise was further towards their position than it might otherwise have been had there not been a compromise. And when there is compromise, both sides can respect the other side and understand that they hold their views strongly and that they have a right to hold their views. Many times they have good reasons to hold their views. And so it's not that we're going to try and force our extreme views upon our fellow Americans, but we're going to find some middle ground 
where we can both shake hands and say, hey, this is better. This is better than it could have been for both of us. And, and you see that, that that compromise is done with a spirit of mutual respect. It's done with a spirit of patience. It's done with a, with a spirit of understanding. It's responsible. It's respectful. And it allows people who disagree to live together and get along well while they continue not just to discuss their differences, not just to debate and argue with each other, but also to see the effects of different views, how they work themselves out over time. And again, if, if you actually believe that your position is true and that your way is superior, having time to allow different views to work themselves out can only be to your advantage. And so a compromise is a temporary resting point between two disagreeing groups that allow both of them to respect one another, move forward, and continue learning and observing. Now this position, as I mentioned, with respect to abortion which we see has become the platform of the 2024 Republican Party, is that it's, it's going to allow the use of an abortion pill treatment at the beginning of pregnancy. I think it's up to 11 weeks, where there's a two, two-step medical treatment that brings a pregnancy to an end. And if you're, if you're going to, to listen to this and respond with this rigid extremity, I really don't care because your position is not tenable. Your position is going to cost Christian views to be easily defeated in, in democratic political contests because it's simply too extreme. It's too rigid. And you can spitefully do that so you can look around at your friends and you can all high-five each other and congratulate each other for how rigid you all are, but you're just going to lose. And the actual situation, after all, if it's, if it's mothers and unborn children that you're actually concerned with, the end situation of your rigidity is going to put those mothers and unborn children in a worst or worse circumstance than a compromised position will do. So you can't, you can't argue that you are for the unborn when your rigidity actually causes them to face worse circumstances. You're really not thinking about the unborn. You're really just thinking about yourself. But this Republican position, by taking a compromising position, is going to soften a lot of the animosity and prove the Republican Party willing to find middle ground and compromise for a position that's better than what it currently is, a position that's better than what it would be. And that's really what makes it a politically superior position. So I'd like to encourage you to consider the two different ways in which people think of this word compromise. The way that extremists think of it, and the way that responsible citizens living in a diverse society think of it. For responsible, respectful citizens, for reasonable citizens, compromise is a way closer to the truth than would result if they took a rigid stance.
For extremists, as I said, compromise means apostasy. But those people take no responsibility for the outcomes of elections. All they care about is their appearance. And so as we see, again, in, in what I think is, a, is an act of God's providence, when we see the Republican Party assisted in a number of different ways, we see this contest bearing its fruits. We see on the left side the absolute circus that surrounds Joe Biden and his administration of freaks, incompetent crazies, whose, whose foolishness is becoming more and more manifest. We're seeing that this contest is beneficial for those who favor the right side of the spectrum. We see many people jumping off the left-wing bandwagon who were on it four years ago. We see many jumping off. And we see that for the extreme right-wingers, this is even unpleasant to them. For example, a woman named Amber Rose spoke at the Republican National Convention yesterday, I believe it was. And she said, these people, the people here at the Republican National Convention, she said, these are my people. Because she's seen what the Democrat Party has done. She's seen those ideas work themselves out. She's seen how the media has falsely spoken of their political opponents. <clears throat> She said she was challenged by her father to actually prove her assumptions about President Trump. And when she looked into it, she learned that she was wrong. And when she turned to this Republican platform, she found that their response reinforced what her father had said and convinced her that the anti-right, the extreme left-wing message was false. And so here she was, this woman who is an immoral woman, for sure, represents an, an immoral social media influencer culture. And yet what's coming out of her mouth is truth. And we can see that this, this contest is manifesting what's true and what's better. With the assassination attempt on President Trump, President Trump was given, again, in God's providence, was given the appearance of an innocent object of violence. And everyone thinking about that, watching that, seeing that, had to take a step back and say, whoa, here we are constantly talking about how these right-wingers are anti-democratic, enemies of democracy and so on, and yet they're the ones in the crosshairs. They're the ones suffering an assassina assassination attempt. And you can see how that's just sort of checked the whole message. I even saw today that CNN had Eric Trump on for an interview, and they're treating him respectfully. Like this, this assassination attempt... attempt for all the talk about needing to cool down the rhetoric, this assassination attempt has effectively cooled down the rhetoric. But we can still see, I mean, the day after the assassination attempt, the extremists, the left-wing extremists, were still all over it, still nasty, critical, saying things that are manifestly false. And the events 
gave Americans the opportunity to to really see the character of the two sides. And they can see, especially by the compromising position being taken by the Republican Party, they can see that the accusations of the left side against the Republicans are manifestly false because it's the Republicans who are the ones offering to compromise. It's the Republicans who are actually showing respect for their opponents, who are showing respect for American freedom. And if anything, that's what's going to win the Republicans the upcoming election. It's that they're imitating the wisdom of the Founding Fathers and compromising with their fellow Americans for the sake of peace so that Americans can actually enjoy life together and their different views, their different lifestyles, and so on can work themselves out and can be observed and people can make choices for themselves not under the influence of threats or violence but under the influence of the merits of those teachings and lifestyles themselves which should be our desire as true Christians and like I said if we're given those circumstances, we should take them because our teaching and our morals are superior. And it's good for everyone to have a chance to see that. And so we should welcome freedom and openness, free market, for example. We should oppose the use of public resources to fund any one particular worldview, even if that worldview is our own. When my wife and I were in graduate school, we were offered government assistance because we we didn't have any income. We had one or maybe even two babies at the time. We had no money. We were in school studying, and we were offered all kinds of benefits, financial benefits from the government. And as we thought about it, we said, no, we we really don't think that this is what government funding should be for. It shouldn't be funding people who are temporarily poor because they're pursuing their own professional development. It should be for people who are actually poor and incapable of helping themselves. And even though we qualified for public resources, we turned them down because we don't believe that that's what those resources should be used for. So even when the government's on our side, that doesn't mean it's right for us to just grab every resource we can. We should still be thinking about what the purpose of tax funding really is, according to the Constitution. We should be thinking about what the purpose of public resources really are. And we should learn to say no thank you when public resources happen to come into the service of our worldview, but might do so with a negative effect, an undesirable negative effect on people who don't agree with us. They may say, look, The only reason you even have these churches is because the government gives you money. The only reason you have this school is because the government gave you this money. And that's not right, because the government shouldn't be supporting a school with a specific religious mission. And I would argue that that's true. And just because the government offers that money, we should look at the principle and ask, is it right for the government to offer this money? And if not, we should say, no thanks, we don't think this is right. Out of respect to our fellow Americans who pay these taxes, it's not right that just because we have a Christian politician in office, we should now use that power to support our own cause. 
we don't need this artificial support. We trust in the virtue of our way itself. And so I think we need to learn to be careful about those things. We need to commit to the Constitution ourselves and realize that Christ is not dependent on any political system or political enforcement of his teaching. Our true kingdom that we belong to as Christians is the kingdom of God, which is manifest in this world in the church. We already have a kingdom. We already have a king. We're not fighting for control of American territory as if our kingdom depends on control of this temporary political system. And we need to manifest that confidence in our system and allow it to work itself out in peace over time. And again, this is why Pope Francis is saying things like we shouldn't proselytize and so on. We don't need to. We want to live as a sign of a contrast, a contrasting way of life, a contrasting system of doctrine and philosophy. We want to be a contrast, but we don't need to be an opposition. That's the important principle. Christ himself said, do not resist evil. And I'd like to leave you with that verse. Do not resist evil. I'd like you to chew on that and ask, what in the world does that even mean? Do not resist evil. I'd like to know your thoughts, what your answer is to that question. I'm not going to leave comments open because, frankly, people who just sit and lurk in the comment sections, I think they're creepy. But if you want to follow up, send me an email. My email is wcm at classicalliberalarts.com. I'd be uh, happy to talk about it. I hope that's helpful. God bless.